Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where my guest today is Jacqueline Winspear. Now, you may know her as the author of the Maisie Dobbs series. You know that small series that has 15 books in it that are loved by so many readers? Well, today we're going to be talking about her memoir. This time next year, we'll be laughing. And we all sort of hope we will be laughing. So it's a best book reporter bets on selection. I read it this weekend. I absolutely love it. And in this interview, I hope you're going to figure out why. So welcome, Jackie. So nice to have you here. And it's lovely to join you. Thank you so much for inviting me. So I love this book. You really brought your family alive for me. I feel like I know <laughs> your family. I feel like I should be having a holiday with them. What made you decide to write this memoir now? Like why at this moment? Well, actually I first started writing a memoir many years ago before I ever touched fiction. I was writing a memoir, but it just, you know, sometimes as a writer, you're, you're trying to bend words to your will. It's kind of like being a sculptor, you know, you're working the clay and the clay never went into the shape that I want it to go into. And why now? Um, I, it just felt like the right time. And I know this sounds kind of odd. I think also my parents passing you know they're now both gone they're both um you know dad passed away in um uh, 2012 mum in 2015 and i i think in a way it gave me permission to mm -hmm. write the story but having said that i think they would have loved the fact that i was writing the story and especially their story um because i wanted to write it and i you know i love playing with time and place and when I was talking to my husband, who's an American, you know, born and raised in Cleveland, very different upbringing to me. And, you know, he was often saying, wow, that's really different, isn't it? You know, and his experience was, yeah. you know, the polar opposite to mine in many ways. So it just felt the right time. And, you know, we've met places along the way. We've met at Bowser yes. Cons, we've met at different conferences, but I didn't know this backstory. And it's just, um, I, I think I understand your other work more for reading it, but I also just feel like it's such a from the heart of what it was really like to be living in the small town that you were living in. I, I don't know, I just love, I love the, your description of the essence of memoir. We don't just look back at an event in our past. We're remembering the, we're remembering the memory of what happened. It's a bit like, I love this, putting the laundry through two wash cycles. <laughs> so how emotional was all that remembering? What was it like to be doing that? Um, I think I didn't realize how emotional it was until I'd finished because I wanted to tell the stories. And then once I'd finished, I, I, I found that there were things that, um, you know, I think you have as a writer and I, maybe I, I can't speak for everyone, I speak for me. I write from the heart anyway. I feel that my stories are in my heart. So I put my heart into it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I expected that emotional, um, fallout's a very strong word, but it's the only one I can grasp at the moment. The, the aftermath of writing a memoir, and there is an aftermath because as you, so as you remember, more memories come back. And it's, and then you have to pick and choose. Otherwise, you know, it would be the sort of, you know, 17 volumes of Jackie Winspear growing up, you know? Mm -hmm, right. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, and it's the ones that really resonate and the ones that reflect most what you're trying to talk about, which for me was family, time and place. Um, the interesting thing actually was, was my brother's reaction. Um, because when, um, I was writing, I said to him after I had the manuscript, look, do you want to read this? Just, I just want to make sure because you know, he's, he's, a, he's got a fairly major role. And mm -hmm. he said, no, 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 I'll, I'll read it when it's done. And then of course, you know, a publisher sends out early copies for review and he found some reviews on the internet and he said, so why haven't I got your book? And I said, well, <laughs> you didn't want it until it's published. He said, well, I want it now. And it was a few weeks ago I said to him, because he had had it for a while, I said, have you read it yet? He said, oh yeah, I've read it three times. I went, what? Oh, and he I just love. read it three times, one after the other. And, uh, and, and only made one little correction for me, uh, which I, I got to hand it to him. And it's really interesting the impact it has on family. 
mm-hmm. you know, um, and not all my, only a couple of members of my family have read it so far, but, but my brother, you know, you ask about my emotional reaction. His was, it has been interesting as well. Yeah, I think it's exactly. actually brought us, uh, we were close anyway, but it's brought us closer in a different way. Um, I was thinking that. I was thinking that because you could now go back and talk about these things that clearly impacted you that yeah. he thinks about. But now it's like, wait, remember that moment? Remember that moment when we were doing X or Y or Z? And I liked it because the three generations of your family are fleshed out. It's not just, you know, you and your parents. It's the generation before as well. Were there lots of notes before the writing actually began? Did you have tons of notes? Not really, no. I mean, I've written on and off about my family. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to contribute to a blog, which is now defunct, called um, nakedauthors.com. So I often wrote about my family because, I, again, I I like the personal essay that you can, something that's happening in the world, you can weave in experience, you can reflect upon it. It could be an anniversary. It could be a similar experience of something. So I have written about my family before, um, but for this, I just kind of jumped in, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, jumped in at the place that felt right. And it was that conversation that my parents had um, when my dad was in his final weeks, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which uh, I, I don't want to give too much away, but when he turned to her and just said, haven't we had a great life? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, you know, went to hear one parent say that to the other. And you, and you know <clears throat> that to outsiders, a lot of that life didn't look so great. Yeah. <clears throat> and they're just saying they're celebrating. They're celebrating in that moment. Mm-hmm. And he wants to make sure he's leaving her <clears throat> with that thought, if it was great. So that if you are going to question later on when I'm gone, I just want you to know, I thought it was a great mm-hmm. life. I thought it was very, very, a uh, very, very poignant moment to be kicking things off. And I love the way you refer to it. And there are lots of quotes I pulled from this book as stop, rewind, now go back a bit more, stop, there it is, now play. Because when you're sitting and having that memory, it's, what did I really hear? Oh, wait, go back a little bit further because the story needs to be told by going back a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And then, wait a second, is that really the way I thought about it? And I just thought it was such a good way of expressing in the terms that we're so used of today, of rewind that video, let me see what they really said, let me see what really happened. Did, reach, did you reach out to the family to enhance any of the personal memories to just? No, that's something um, I didn't do. <laughs> because the, then it, it changes my memory of a story mm-hmm. I've heard. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I have, you know, since heard other stories, and but I, I'm, I'm like, I'm like a little story collector anyway. I think actually all writers do this. You know, you, you hear snippets of conversation, you hear family discussions, especially when people lower their voices and, and you're a kid. It's not, I don't know what they're talking about, but I think I need to know this. But you collect those stories and those impressions. So no, I, I didn't. Because, you know, we all, it, it's like a, 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 a prism. We're all coming from a different point to look right. at an event. And how I remember it might not be how someone else remembers it. I mean, I think one of the revelations for my brother was everything that happened when he had uh, his appendicitis. Mm -hmm, Because mm -hmm. he was somewhat out of it. There are things that he remembered. But then, you know, when I said to him, well, the surgeon was an American. It's, was he? You know? (laughs) um, so, So, no. But that point you make about the stop, rewind, and so on. I think in a way, memoir has, there's a certain, there's a lot in common with cinematography because we zoom the camera in to describe a scene. We, you know, pan to, to look at a, a, a larger sort of panorama to see what is happening in that little speck there, you know. And so, there, so there's that sort of sense of uh, almost documentary, I think. Mm-hmm when you're writing now that that's just my personal perspective but yeah i would say that when i was reading i was feeling it was very cinematic in tone i felt i was watching 
I felt like I was watching the movie of your life and I was reading the movie <laughs> of your life. I really do because your descriptions are so good, but it's also the way you juxtapositioned what had happened to everybody and what had gone on. I felt like it was very well played out. And sometimes when you th read things, they're dull spots and there weren't any. And I will tell you that sometimes if you're reading a memoir, somebody's going to get obsessed with something, but you had these quick takes of, we'll talk about some of them as, as we go through, but I felt that it was all still flowing. And it was obvious that you were a very strong storyteller. Sometimes people, when they get caught up in their memories, they're not telling a story at the same time. It's, it's like cut and dried like this, mm -hmm. but this was like weaving me through of what was going on, which I think comes a lot from also your beautiful fiction writing of being able to tell an arc of a story, how to do the arc of the memoir. I felt like you were doing at the same time. I think uh, when, you know, I've always been interested in how we express uh, time and place and time I've, I've realized really fascinates me, mm -hmm. which is why I think I loop back and forth a bit that something that happened then, how the thread goes through to now, you know, and I describe, for example, my grandfather's shell shock. One of the um, aspects of that was a, a, a very deep sensitivity to sound. So my dad grew up in a um, very quiet house. So he didn't really like loud noises. My you, as I say, he made an exception for a good swing band when he and my mum were dancing. Mm -hmm. But I find that, you know, I, I, I love music, but I don't like everything booming at me. I don't like mm -hmm. sudden loud noises. I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. so, so, but that's just an example. How, how does the past come like in waves to the present and then loop back again? Yeah, and with that, let's talk about your mom's memories of down evacuation, which you describe <laughs> as an experience, albeit an unwanted one. And you know, I always thought that children would go, these, these families would want them, they would go, the children would be well cared for, well taken care of, everything would be lovely, it'd be sort of like their vacation of going on a vacation or a holiday. And reading this, I realized there was a lot, there could be abuse, there could be people that didn't want them. They were just there for the money, you know, just for what was going on. So to, let's share a little bit about what happened with your mother with down evacuation, like when yeah. she had to go. Yeah, it, it was the reason she was used to refer to it as when we went down evacuation. But that's because, you know, going from London to Kent, for example, you go, if you're looking at a map, you go down right. and, you know, you were going to be evacuated. And she was evacuated with her younger siblings. There were 10 in the family. The older three ended up in the services, uh, which left seven. And she was evacuated with um, another five of her siblings. The youngest one um, was not evacuated at that time because she was too young. Actually, that was my youngest aunt and she's only recently passed away, actually. Aww. But she had lots of, you know, and she's always liked to tell me her stories. Um, but anyway, uh, it was very difficult because uh, I think, even though the evacuation of children in a time of war was, should there be another war, was planned right from the end of the First World War. It was somewhat chaotic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't a case of people said, oh, yes, we would love you to come and stay with us. You know, people were paid. You, you mm -hmm. didn't do it for nothing, for a start. And, yes, there was a certain amount of volunteering in an area, but some people didn't really want to take in kids from London because they thought, oh, you know, they're London kids. So, but the funny thing is that the experiences of, of children were so vastly different because there were some children that came from homes in London that, you know, had indoor bathrooms and things like that. And they suddenly they're living in some little ramshackle cottage in the country somewhere. And they have to walk right down to the bottom of the garden to use the privy, you know, which for London kids is terrifying, you know. It's just like, yeah, not good. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but in fact, for my mother and um, her siblings, it was very challenging for the girls in particular because um, the, uh, the, in the family to which they were um, evacuated, uh, the, the man was a, um, he, as they said, used to say in those times, interfered with little girls. Mm -hmm. And my mom spent half her time, I think, stopping that happening, um, being incredibly vigilant. 
which showed up in her later life. She was mm -hmm. a hyper vigilant person, you know. Um, you know, when I was a child, it was don't speak to strangers, don't do this. I, I actually wasn't quite sure what a stranger was, mm -hmm. but <laughs> you know, there was that fear as well that something terrible could happen to you. Um, and then, and then when you're 14, you're like you. Okay, now you can go back. Now all of a sudden it's safe for you. I did like that as well. You yeah, know? that was also, you know, I mean, her mother wanted to, uh, wanted them back as soon as they were 14 to go out to work, mm -hmm. uh, which broke my mother's heart because you were evacuated with your school um, in general. And that gave a sense of continuity. But, you know, if you think of my, my mother, it was, um, and my aunt has told me a certain extent about her recollections of this, that, you know, I think it took them three days to get to wherever they were going and it wasn't that far. It's just mm -hmm. that they were, they went to one sort of, um, it was a sort of stately home where they opened up one of the big rooms and they, the kids had to sleep on the floor. And then they went somewhere else. <clears throat> and eventually they went to this particular town where they were put into the cattle pens where normally they would have the, the sort of the, 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 the annual, the, the market, the cattle market. Mm -hmm. And the people would come along and say, oh, well, you know, I'll take those two. I'll have that one. You know, oh, I'll take those two boys. Farmers liked boys because they could put them to work. And, they and um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, my one of my uncles ran away at the age of eight. Eight. He was eight years old when he ran away because he missed his mum so much. Tried to get back to London, and uh, didn't make it before he was caught. Well, you, know. you think about even like you know, the pandemic today, everybody's locked in together. But if they sat there and said, oh, your children are going to have to go X or Y or Z, people would be, I mean, children wouldn't be able to cope. The coping skills weren't there like at all. But I feel like um, the way you were describing what the, they were just very much, well, this is what we have to do. This is what we must do. Yes. This is what we yes. must do. And we will <laughs> abide by what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Except I think it, it helped. I don't know that any of it helped really but um you know you went with your school there was a, fam a familiarity with your teachers and so on mm -hmm. um but uh you know my mom said she can re said told me that she could uh, remember walking to the station or you know children in what they used to call a crocodile holding hands and the mums following and then they could only go so far and their children were loaded onto trains uh to go to they didn't know where they were going they had a little label you know tied to their their coat and uh they had um a bag with their belongings on and my mum was instructed just keep everybody together her mum said keep everybody together and um, but she couldn't she couldn't keep the boys with with her and um, one of my uncles was um ended up being evacuated. <laughs> he uh, I, my the the family made me laugh about this i'd heard this story years ago that he um was um taken in by a very well-to-do couple he was quite young so oh how, how old was he? he would have been about six or something like that maybe younger five or six and very well-to-do couple who actually wanted to adopt him and my grandmother of course said absolutely not but they they made him into sort of like a little lord fauntleroy <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he came home with a very let's say a very posh accent and immediately had sort of nine other kids laying into him saying <laughs> who do you think you are but his, were his, you so special? You know, yeah. you're not special. <laughs> and he came home thinking he was very special. You know, um, he was actually one of my favorite uncles. But very impressionable, very impressionable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I learned so much in, about life in England post-war. I mean, I thought I knew a lot, but this book fleshed out so much of what was happening outside the city because mm -hmm. you knew a lot about what was going on there. And then I loved your dad's line: "Is never to be wed to the past, love. Never be wed to the past." how has the past affected your present is what I'm really sitting there thinking. And I think he spent a lot of time just sitting there like, don't get stuck back here. Just move on, go on with your life. Do you think that he did a very good or They both did a very good job of being able to do that. Just move on from where it was. I think so. I think so. I mean, they were both deeply affected, I think by, you know, their growing up, but my dad was definitely one to say, just move on from it. You know, I can remember when I bought my first house and he said something similar to me that um, I, he, he was, uh, he came up because he was really, you know, he's one of those really handy people. He worked in the construction business so, and I needed work to be done. And he was putting in a new sill. Um, I, I don't see them so much on American houses, perhaps on the East Coast more so. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's as you go into the house, there's the sill mm. near the step and it has weather stripping in it. And anyway, he was, I, I was just coming home one day and a piece of brick dropped out and I went, oh, and I picked it up. I said, I'm going to keep that brick from my home. <laughs> bricked from my first house and he just said no he said do not be and he said the same almost the same thing do not be wed to bricks and mortar never be wed to never be wed to bricks and mortar because it will mean you'll never move on you'll never go to where you're meant to be next isn't that interesting so it's like okay you could want to have an adventure never be so locked down and enjoy a place so much that it won't let you have another place to go yeah. it's another yeah. thing to do yeah yeah Mind you, he was a fine one to talk, I will say. You know? Yeah, just wait a second. I think he lived in the same place for a very long time. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, wait a second. We're off the beaten track living here. The rest of the family's in London. Are you sure, Dad, about that? Or maybe he was telling you, don't be like me. You know, do something different from what I did. I think I, I would say that my, my parents wanted us to be adventurous. Mm -hmm. They wanted us to enjoy our lives and see as much of the world as we could because of course their generation uh, they couldn't see mm -hmm. as much of the world but as soon as they were able they loved to travel they loved coming over to the america really loved it so yeah, that would be I, nice you describe that of like you know they coming to the states and a lot of people would say oh my children are moving that far away they're like we'll book our ticket we'll come see you so that yeah. we could see your world and be part of it and i thought that was so lovely yeah what was it like writing such a personal story compared to mystery writing? Was it a different vibe that you had to do or was it, was writing writing to you? Well, writing's writing. Um, here's the thing about mystery, I suppose. I always see it as the archetypal journey through chaos to resolution. And so I, I often don't think, oh, I'm writing a mystery. I think I'm telling a story. It has a certain framework, but I'm, I'm telling a story about what happens to this set of people with this set of circumstances at this time. And there's, as I say, an arc to the story. I think in a way, writing memoir, especially as I've constructed it, which is a series of stories, if you will, there is that going through chaos and then there is a resolution found, mm -hmm. you know, so there is, there was that chaotic time for example when i had an accident at 15 mm -hmm. months and that plays out in different ways you know it comes up in a different way as time goes on but there is a definite arc to that part of my story mm -hmm. there's an arc to the story of of uh, you know my mum for example being evacuated in the war to my father's army um experiences and indeed to my grandfather and grandmother and how it's kind of interesting how all those arcs come in to, to make mm -hmm. it is. a saga, I suppose. And you know what? It, there's also this pervading of what had happened with your mother. She never got more educated than 14. And that's always playing in the back of her mind as she's trying to get a job, as she's going for places. And when you think about what she achieved, like where she had gone on with limited education, but mm -hmm. it was really, um, I saw in her such perseverance. Mm -hmm. So this can do kind of attitude and I will make this work. And why should I just be stuck? Like when she goes in and asks the dentist for a raise and she doesn't get it, her idea is not to sit back down and take it. It's what am I going to do next? Where yeah. am I going to go? I, what do I deserve? I will say that all my uncles and aunts and my, and my cousins all, I, I think we're all a bit like that. You know, it's just like, okay, that door's closed. I'm going to find the next one that opens because Although my mother's formal education ended when she was 14, her education didn't end then. Mm -hmm. And that's the same if I look to my uncles and aunts, they all did pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. And all of them left school at 14. She wasn't the only one that won a scholarship and couldn't take it up to mm -hmm. a, a, a good school. You know, if I think of my aunt in Canada, you know, she... She worked for the government for years. She did really well. She was flying all over the place. Um, you know, various, my uncles and aunts, they, they, they did interesting things. And mm -hmm. certainly that's true of my cousins, you know, and on both sides of the family, you know. Um, uh, so it's, it's, there's a, there's just because you have not had formal education or your formal education ended early, it doesn't mean to say that you're not educated because, oh boy, are the family voracious readers. You know, my grandmother was, 
was a, I mean, real reader. I don't know how she ever managed to have 10 kids, actually. <laughs> how she managed to do that when she's sitting doing the reading. Well, you know, it was interesting. My uncle passed away, oh my gosh, it's years ago now. But I never realized until his funeral what had happened to him during World War II. I never realized he left high school after his sophomore year. And he went over and he was in Italy and he was actually helping my family. Um, my family heard it just from Italy. He was helping a lot of family members that were hiding in caves, like all mm. these very interesting points. But he didn't learn until his funeral about all these pieces. And he came back and he got into college and he was going at nights and he went on to have this big job with the American Cancer Society. Like when she reaches for a cigarette, give her a kiss instead was one of his lines that he came up wow. with, which is hugely pivotal but you realize that there was this whole gap in his education along the way. But where he, what he had done in the war impacted so much. And you know, these days, everybody is so into getting their kids into college and getting them into this, that, the other thing. And I'm like, real world experience. Look what it meant for the whole, what it was the greatest generation. Like, what did it really mean for these people? Mm. It was being boots on the ground of figuring it out. It wasn't just sitting in a classroom someplace. It's world knowledge. Absolutely true. And there's one, there's a phenomenon that happened on both sides of the Atlantic. And that was the, and it started, I think, in the sort of mid 1800s with the Industrial Revolution and so on. And that was the whole idea of quote unquote night school that, mm -hmm. you know, you went to college and in, in definitely, you know, in the UK, and I've, I know for a fact here too, that there were whole institutes set, built and set up purely for people so they could continue their education at night mm -hmm. or whatever on their own. And, and, you know, no one had distance learning then <laughs> you oh, no. just came home, mm -hmm. you had a bite to eat if you were lucky or you went straight back to school again and you didn't go, you know, my mom definitely and her siblings all took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. all took, as did I, you know, at a certain point in my life. Yeah, and, and you know, right after the pandemic hit, Harvard was doing some free classes online and people were just jumping on to do yeah. them because it was an opportunity. And I think that it's the, the book is very much about seizing opportunity as time goes on. It's not obstacle, it's opportunity. And what do you do when opportunity presents yourself? And I think that so many times people get so lazy of there's a natural progression to things and this was not gonna be a natural progression. It was gonna go like back and forth, different, different, different places. You know, your mystery writer friends um, encourage you to take notes. I know Hallie Ephraim was telling you to take mm -hmm. notes as things were going on during your parents' health crisis. And I thought about this um, a couple of years ago, probably a few years ago at this point, historical fiction um, author, Alison Pataki was facing a health crisis with her husband. And Lee Woodruff, whose husband was Bob Woodruff, had been injured in a, mm -hmm. in a terrible accident, said, yes. take notes because you, um, some of the effect that you want to write notes at the moment because you won't remember it the same way later. Like just mm -hmm. make sure you have everything down. And do you feel that to be true? Like, you know, you're going off of memory, but at the same time when your parents were dying, there was like, take notes, take notes on how yeah. you're feeling yeah. right now because you're going to interpret it differently later. I didn't take as many notes as I think I, I could have because I was, I was really exhausted actually. I had quite mm -hmm. a lot on my plate to be perfectly honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were some things I definitely wrote down. Um, but I, I don't know. I, 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 I like to take notes anyway. I tell you, I note down little things. I don't make copious notes. I'll write down just a few words. You know, um, if, if, you know, if someone says something, for example, and I, I, the words sort of stay with me, um, and they might turn up anywhere once I've taken, but, but it was actually when I shared with Holly the, the story of my brother finding something while we were clearing my mum's, uh, when she was actually in the hospital before she went to um, uh, move from the house and some, something I found actually, and uh, his work from school and uh, pointed out to him that it was actually really, really good, even though the teacher had not given him a good mark. And uh, it was a lovely moment actually, because I, you know, I, I told him, you know, basically, you know, that, that stinky teacher didn't get it right. This is really good writing. And he just said to me, I'll just throw it away. It's nothing, you know. And then I just put it to one side and then saw him tuck it away in his case, which was really a lovely moment, you know. But those little um, special things. Yeah, those yeah, little special I, moments. I think there are little special moments. And, and, and just as a, 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 an aside, to give an example of that, um, a few years ago, I was in the process of buying a horse and uh, you know, a vet comes out to do the vet check, 
and I was standing next to him as we watched the horse being trotted away from us. You know, they do this flex thing called a flexion test. And he looked at me and he went, got snappy little hocks, ain't she? And I thought, I have got to write that down. <laughs> and I literally, as soon as his back would talk, got snappy little hocks. You can bet that is going to appear in one of my books, you exactly. know? And so there's things that people say that you just have to keep and, um, you know, things that, um, you know, my, my, you know, definitely not that I mentioned this in his, in, in the memoir, but, you know, in my father's last day, my, my mother was very concerned that he wasn't getting enough sustenance. And mm -hmm. I knew it was, it, it was too late. You know, there was mm -hmm. no reason to give him sustenance. We were on the home stretch, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, so she's sitting there saying, but if he eats, that would be a good thing. He yeah. should be eating. He should be doing this. And she insisted on bringing a fresh tube of toothpaste in for him, the, you know, the day before he died, which mm -hmm. was, you know, it's what it is. It's that desire just to try and keep everything normal. Normal. I was just going to say, you're looking for normalcy. You know, we looking look for normal. And haven't we been all doing that in the last, mm -hmm. you know, 10 months? Let's mm -hmm. look for normal. Mm -hmm. and you know it's and, and people talk about the new normal but you know there is not a new normal because normal is not going to happen for a long time and in truth normal doesn't exist it's just a, it's a myth <laughs> it's just life it's just life yeah. life has shifted it's not like this is normal this is the mm. this is like what your life is now this is what's going yeah. on it's funny you say that about finding things um i've been going through the attic we've lived in this house for 31 years i've accumulated a lot of stuff I clearly yeah. never threw out anything my kids did in school and I'm making them each a box. And I said, and you're not getting it now because you throw the whole thing out. And someday like that, well, that piece that your brother has, it is going to matter, but it's not going to matter now. So yeah. I'm going through and I'm figuring out the things. I also realized that I am a real pack rat. I found the birth announcement for a friend's child who's now 31. <laughs> So I was like, would you like, and I've been snapping pictures of these things as I find them and saying to my friends and go, look what I found. I didn't throw it out yet. You know, so, yeah. So my like really my father kept every single birthday card he had ever received from my brother and I, right from the ones where, you know, it's scribble across the page, every single birthday card. And, you know, when you live an awful long way away, you have to be pretty ruthless with stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, all their certificates from their ballroom dancing and things like that. It's just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with these? So I kept a few, you know, mm -hmm. it's, then what, you know, uh, and, and, and you cherish things for a while and then you think, oh, you know, yeah, so not to be wed to the past, <laughs> not to be wed to the past. And I know that if I'm going through this now, going through all these boxes and I know I've just whittled it down. I know I'll do another like, okay, over but it's, it's the interesting the, the memories that are coming up with it you know i really love that there was a rhythm to life when you were living on the farm i really love that that was going on and there were different seasons this is what happens it's planting it's cultivating it's harvesting whatever did you love that time in your life because it sure felt like it was this amazingly wonderful time i think you know being bo born and raised in a very rural area working on farms and so on you do have that sense of a rhythm to everything there is a season mm -hmm. and i think it's incredibly grounding um and and that's it, i think it's isn't that a great word it's grounding and there you are in the ground yeah. you know you mm -hmm. you 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 have your hands in the earth mm -hmm. i think that's something that's missing very much for so many people today um and look how people have been rushing from the cities during the covid thing because they suddenly realize you know what i'm stuck here and i have to get out of here because you know i mean even 200 years ago people had their feet on the earth mm -hmm. every single day and agriculture we were so so much more sort of attached or sort of connected with it mm -hmm. and i think that is something that that is with me still you know that's well, I go out for hikes and, you know, I spend a lot of time in nature. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I have to have trees around me, you know, and mm -hmm. fields and be able to see wildlife. And, and I actually love, I love farms. Actually, I don't live on a farm. I live near ranches, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that's an interesting thing because I, I love the seasons as they come to me through being near an agricultural area. You know, the fact that, you know, in April I can smell the orange blossom. You know, I can wake up and smell that orange blossom. I have a friend who lives right in the Napa Valley and she loves which of course has been very badly struck by wildfire, but she was pretty much raised there. And she said she loves crush that time of the year when you can smell mm -hmm. the crush, you know, it's not just smelling, you're not just smelling grapes, you smell the crush. And for me, there were, there were certain times of year when just the, the sense of the, the aroma in the air just would, this is a season and hop picking was very big because it was, uh, a, a very significant industry in Kent where I'm from that's changed now but you know it's it was also the time in school the school year when you go up a year so there was always that sense that you're moving you know there's this aroma in the air and you're moving on and up yes I love I love it that life has a rhythm and I think we feel that rhythm more keenly when we are close to the natural world obviously mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Obviously, and it, it, these last couple of months, so many people started growing. They would start growing vegetables. They were. When I went to the garden center. Look, I've gardened for years, and I went in. And I was like, "Where are all the plants?" And they were like, "Oh no, you don't understand. Everybody's already been here." It's. I was like, "Wow, I'm usually on my usual timing." In fact, last uh, two nights ago, we had a very hard freeze here, and we had everything covered outside. But we went out this morning, and all the basil's gone. Like even yeah. under the tarp. And I'm like kicking myself of like, why did I just not go out last week and cut it all back? Like, what yeah. was I thinking? Yeah. And all of a sudden it was, everything was green and everything went brown and black. Like, yeah. like really in two days, it's like everything has completely changed. And I'm like, why was I not on top of this? What was I doing? Oh, I you was know, reading books or doing life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I had a really funny experience at the end of last week. Um, no, sorry. What are we? Yeah, it was the end of last week. I had to go to the post office and I had a package that was all ready to go. All I had to do was pop it on the side. So, which you, you know, so I went in and there's everybody socially distanced about four or five people. And there was this one man at the counter and he was obviously collecting something. And the, um, the postmistress came out and she's got three cake crates, narrow crates, you know, about six inches tall and she's holding them like this. And the chirruping that was coming from inside the crates, everybody just looked. And, and we all watched this man collect his crates and go out. And I said, what's in those crates? You know, and everybody listened as I said, what's in those crates? And she said, oh, the baby chickens. I said, who knew the post office shipped chicks? And of course, everybody just started laughing about the idea of the post office shipping chicks. <laughs> you know? But I found it fascinating that, that, you know, it, it, it would have not be more surprising had they c came out with a with a, a bull or something and said, oh, this is for you. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. In the back room, what that must have been like, like oh, would they come pick up the chicks already? Yeah, I know. Oh, a chick, 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 chick. All this, you could just imagine, oh, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. <laughs> it was, oh, we're going it was to do. so this funny. Is what we're do. I loved <laughs> it. I loved it because I would, I would love to have chickens, but... Uh, my now they get big and then they yeah. smell and then yeah. it's a mess and it's yeah but you know i know how to look after chickens i'm a country yeah. girl <laughs> yeah we we live we where we live it's very country like here and there are places you can go get somebody say i have fresh eggs today i'll be very yeah. happy to go pick them up i'm very happy to go see their setup yeah. it's yeah. lovely i just yeah. love it i love that your mom would take you once a week to town for errands and that the library was a stop on that trip. But I love the way, the journey of going into town because this was not close. I mean, these people did not need Fitbit. These people did not need to measure their steps. There were so many steps. And here you're either walking or on your, you know, your trike or whatever. She's pushing the stroller and then she's gonna put all the food in there. Your brother's gonna have a little squished in the front. And then you go to the library and get the books and carry those home. And we think that we're so pampered these days of, I, mean, I know kids that wouldn't like, oh, I don't even want to carry from the library to my, my car, let alone what life was like. But the library was such a special moment because she didn't just get for her, she got for the whole neighborhood. I love that. Yes, she did. And you know, it wasn't a stroller, as we know, a stroller. It was a big baby carriage, the sort they had then with one, you know, you have the two big wheels and then the two smaller wheels. And 
you know, as I said in the book, you know, I, 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 especially when she had the, 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 the summer canopy on, you know, which was made of this white cotton brochure on glaze, you know, she, it, it made my brother look as though he was in a ship in full sail, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she would um, be because there were elderly people on our street, and she would get the take their library books back. She would choose books for them because she knew everybody's tastes. You know who liked the romances. You know the fact that Mr. Kilby liked the westerns, as did my dad. And uh, I knew all the little phases she went through. And and literally as the shopping went into the pram, and then the books went into the pram. You know, my brother was scrunched up, and I'm sure you know, no wonder he wailed. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was like. <laughs> you know, a book, another book, you're slinging another book at me. But yeah, uh, yeah and I was allowed to choose my two books. And uh, I, I, I really, it was a very small, very, very tiny library. And, and a few years later, it moved into bigger premises. You know, uh, I think when I was about 16, 17, they built a brand new youth club and there weren't enough youth for the youth club. So they ended up putting the library. <laughs> This is fascinating, though. You know, because it, I just picture him in like some big version of a wheelbarrow, just being carted into kind town. Kind of, yeah. And kind it's like of. bumpy. I mean, he's like you know bumping all over the place at the same time. It's not like there's yeah. smooth roadway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's an, another line that's so lovely. There's a lot of wonderful lines, but I hate to see empty houses, homes from which the soul of a family has taken flight. And it was when you had gone back to see, you know, the, the home that you were at. And home means so much to so many people. These days, I think it means even more. I think it's one of the reasons that people are fleeing the city and they're trying to make home. Like, what is home going to mean? As you've gone back, have your feelings changed as your perspective has changed when you go back? Or do you go back and immediately feel that warmth of everything of being there? Places change, you know, the, the everything changes. And, uh, in the town that uh, was closest to where I grew up, you know, the main town was two, mile, two miles away. You know, it's become a little bit more shishi, I would say, a few more shops for, that sell things that people don't need, but they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a kid, you know, you went to the fishmonger, you went to, you know, there were three or four butchers in town, you know, there were a couple of tea shops, there was, um, you know, uh, the, the, the hardware store, this store, that store, you know, the grocery stores and so on. There were also what we used to call haberdashery shop, uh, stores, mm -hmm. you know, the, where you could buy everything from a shirt to your, you know, tea towels and things like that. And now there are more shops where, you know, it's, it's, yeah, stuff. <laughs> it's elite. It's an elite stuff. It's things. yeah, Yeah, it's stuff. And um, so I think there's not that sense of, of people going about their business and then you stop as you go about what you're doing in your day. You know, there's uh, where people didn't have a chance to really wonder because they had to get on to the next thing, mm -hmm. but there was still time to talk and to, you know, it's that, uh, as I said, the web holding community together. I think mm -hmm. it's lovely. And I, um, you know, I love living in that kind of place. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah, really, yeah, even this week we did Halloween with the children and we put the candy up on the streets and everything. And it was just like, we came together of how we're going to make this work for the kids. I think they loved it because they didn't have to walk down long driveways. They thought this was like totally perfect because it was like, wait, can we do that again next year? Because, you know, like we don't want to ring the doorbell. It's much more expedient to just pick up and go. But it was interesting to see how when things happen, like what's going on right now, what people will do to try to make it work. And I think that when you were going into town, it was like, well, I was pushing the stroller the whole way, but by the same token, I was going to get to see everybody. I was going to yeah. get to visit. I was going to have a special moment. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, you know, I just, I loved, there were shops that I loved going into, you know, I, um, the, the stationery shop, you know, where it was sold all sorts of things, not just stationery, it was magazines, newspapers, toys, but a lot of things that you would, you know, it's where I was allowed to buy my first fountain pen and things like that. And, you know, these, these uh, wooden floors and there was this always, a, it always felt that there was a certain smell in there, you know, it's always smelt like ink and blotting paper and magazines and newsprint. We, uh, so it was, it was lovely. It's a, it's a different shop now. And so it just smells of candy, I suppose, but you know, it's, um, it was, it was lovely. And also it was slightly dark. So I don't know. There's there was lots of lovely memories and lovely experiences that I could reflect upon, and you know, 
the, a certain richness to that as well. Yeah. You know, you also came to understand class and your station in life as it applies to what meals were called. Because <laughs> it was tea, is this, if you're rich, if you're that. And it was just very interesting to see that whole perspective that, oh, wait, we're eating that way? Is that not the way everyone does it? Yeah, it's it when well, it's true. And funny enough, one of my um, friends who's currently reading my memoir, I sent her a copy, um, and she just she thought that was great. She said, "Gosh," she said, "you know, it's it's so true." You know, because she she grew up in Yorkshire, and she she was like me. You know, your tea was your evening meal. Supper was that slice of toast and a cup of hot chocolate you had before you went to bed. Well, actually, we didn't call it hot chocolate in those days. It was a cup of cocoa. You know, and, um, you know, and, and funny enough, you know, dinner, school dinners, everybody laughs about school dinners. That's what you had at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we were out working on the farm, you know, lunch was something you had around about 10 o'clock in the morning. That's what we called it. That was our lunch. It wasn't coffee break or something. You might have a cup of coffee, but it wasn't called coffee break. Yeah, and then yeah. you had your dinner and then we had our tea at six o'clock. And that it's always interesting to me, for, although there is... Um, in, in Britain, depending again on your station in life, you know, tea, as in afternoon tea, if you're doing a posh afternoon tea, that's sort of something you have around about three or four o'clock. Whereas if you have high tea, that is something more substantial that you would have around about five or six o'clock. And then you might have, depending on your station in life, supper a bit later on, which was a meal. We mm. didn't do that in my house. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is that when I coming to America and hearing people talk about high tea and what they're having is a cup of tea and a few scones. That to me is just a cup of tea and a few scones. That is not high tea. High tea would have a savory in there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. And also, yes, different quote unquote, you know, classes of people would have different, uh, a, a different vocabulary for the meals they, they eat. Yeah, and you're sitting there like, wait a second, I'm a kid. Like, wait a second, what yeah. are you eating? What is this? Yeah. Oh, I'm learning here. I'm learning. Yeah. You know, life was challenging in many ways. I mean, let's get serious about it. It was very, very challenging when you were growing sure up. Sure was. But it was, it, at the time, it was your life. And now you're seeing it. How do you think that shaped who you are for what you went through? Because there's so much on the page that I've known you for years that I did not know that this was, you know, growing up and, you know, the, the way you lived. And how do you think it shaped to the person you are? I think something that I definitely got from my mother's generation and my mother and father's generation, and this will be true of my cousins and true of so many people I know, is that it gives you a sense of endurance and resilience. You know, it's do not whine about stuff. You just get on with it. You know, there was that just get on with it. It's not just keep calm and carry on it was get on with it you know what are we all going to do are we all going to sit and whine or are we going to do something mm -hmm. you know i remember even as a child if something went wrong i was allowed a certain amount of time to cry and then it was you know that's enough it's, mm -hmm. it's are you done yet and if you're done get on with in fact here's a little story i didn't tell when i was a very little girl i had uh, this little chair that was given to me and one day when something had happened if I was going to cry about anything, it was about animals that died. So that was probably it. And I went and my mum said, well, go to your crying chair. And after that, she called it my crying chair. And I only went to, and, and if I was sad, I'd go to my crying chair and she would come along and say, have you finished yet? Oh, I said, well, no, I've got a bit more to go. And so, but once you were out, I was out and this is, I'm talking about three years old, that sort of age. Once I was done, I had to be done with it. There was no going back and grizzling about it again. In fact, that was my, one of my mum's terms, to stop grizzling about things, just get on with it. On. And, and so I think here's what that's done. That's given me, I think, a sense of um, resilience, endurance. It's sort of, um, you know, that you can get things done, that mm -hmm. you can go through whatever this is you have to go through. And... Um, also a work ethic, mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. a work ethic, um, which is not always to one's advantage. I mean, I've, one of my cousins has tried to retire four times. I think he's making another stab at it. Mm -hmm. Another one of my cousins who left school, I think he was 15 when he left school, now about 67. 
And last year at my aunt's 90th um, birthday party, I found out he's just completed a degree in applied mathematics. Mm -hmm. He's probably the only one in, I mean, he, uh, um, applied mathematics. I mean, right. I got, that's something for fun. Just, oh, just for fun. Of, Let me take, take off my hat. I take right. off my hat to you. Right. But, but I don't, I wouldn't want you to think that's just me and my family. This, it's a, it's a, it's a real generational thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. It speaks to um, again to time and place, mm -hmm. you know. I think, you know, when you've you've been through a war, you know, it's like what else can what else is going to hurt me? You know? Well, you know, and that leads me to there were surplus women and the old ladies' home. It wasn't the old people's home; it was the old yeah. ladies' home. And we touch on the effects of war on family in many ways that we don't really think about. And there was such a toll beyond those who died. There were all these women that would never marry. There were all these people that would never have children. There are always people that would have a very different life. It would always be maiden. They would always, and even the woman that you found something that from when her husband, I'm not going to give anything away, had, had passed, her boyfriend had passed away. Her, the, and she gave you a memento. And it was these things that these people carried as memories, but they went on with their lives. But there were whole generations of people or whole groups of people that were very much impacted by this, just as being the surplus women. And I just said, you know, there are things that we think about with the war, but then it's like, well, who were those people that mm -hmm. just never got the opportunity that others did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was, you know, the, the First World War. And I think one of the things that I, I look back on the, at the time, I used to think, oh, God, you know, I'm living in this place with all these old people. And although I really loved listening to stories when they came my way, but that's one thing that I think has been a gift is that, being able to observe and see people that had lived through different a different era and to be close to those people. And of course, you know, I, I, I knew kids and so on. But having that proximity to people that would often say in my day, you know, mm -hmm. and also that where I lived, it had so many connections to a different age, which was very, I mean, there are certain things, for example, the hunt, fox hunting, which is actually hunting a fox in the way that it's been done for years is now illegal in Britain, but the hunt still meets to go off and they chase, you know, a scent instead. But when I was a kid, it was the hunt in a very traditional sense. They met at the local pub as they would do now for their stirrup cup before going off. But then when, but when I was a kid, there were ladies who still rode side saddle with mm. the typical habit, the little bowler hat, and that's just an example of how that I sometimes felt I was in this bubble that I was this kid, you know, that was born in the middle of the, the sort of the, 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 the I guess the 21st century, um, mm -hmm. but 20th, 20th century, sorry. And um, middle of the 20th century. And yet the place had its roots in Edwardian times, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I think that, that, that gave me a lot. They gave me a lot. It definitely gave me a lot of material in later years. You know, and I was, I was thinking about this. There are details about the war, like the medical blue uniforms, which I had not thought about, and the white feather movement. And you write about war and its effects in the Maisie Dobbs series. Did writing this book bring you more ideas? Now, granted, it's a different time there, but it's, did it give you more ideas about like, how people behaved and what they've done? I, it, writing the memoir hasn't given me more ideas. It just probably expresses the ideas I already had, mm -hmm. you know, because I, um, just from knowing my grandparents, my parents, my family, the people I grew up around, I had, it, give, it gives you a sense of um, the way people thought about things, the way they expressed themselves or didn't, the language they used. So it all is in the mix. You know, and some people might have to research that sort of thing. And I don't have to research it because it's all there automatically mm -hmm. in little ways. For example, um, and I, this is an example I've, I, th I think I've used before when I've spoken. It, it's just a small thing, but my grandmother would, ever, would never have said, well, I won't do that. She would say, I shan't. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, but she wouldn't have say, I wouldn't say, um, well, I'll do that in a minute. She would say, I'll do that presently. Mm -hmm. You know, little, little, so sort of it's, it's aspects of locution which are, uh, which suggest time and place. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, certain sayings, well, be that as it may, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, one of my favorites was, you know, I, I don't want to over egg the pudding, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to over egg the pudding, but this is what I think about that, you know, or something. So um, all the things that it's a bit like, you know, she's got snappy little hocks, ain't she? I, I've collected those things. I collected those things as a child. I kept mm -hmm. them in my head, though. I didn't always write them down, but I kept yeah. them. It was like, okay, yes, I have this little moment. I have this yeah. little thing. I'm going to just trap that up. Yeah. You know, as rich as your writing is, and the book is so fantastic, there's this wonderful epilogue with even more. <laughs> and there's these little nuggets about your family. And I'm going to urge readers, when you read this book, don't miss the epilogue because there's so many great pieces in there. And it's almost like, and now, wait, I forgot that one. But let me just get that in there, though, too, because it was really important. And I just love that that, you know, the way that all worked. Well, let's talk about the title for a moment, because I think this is going to sell this book more than anything else. <laughs> and every time I told people, I posted up on social media that I was reading this book, and they go, I hope it's true. They said, is, there, is she clairvoyant? What does she know? You know, was the title always this year, this time next year, we'll be laughing? Was that always it? Always, or? always, always. And I've got to tell you, for, for years. So it is not with a reflection of um, our current political situation or whatever um it was something my dad used to say yeah. and whenever we went through a difficult time and uh, people that read the memoir will know there's quite a few of those difficult times he just had this real i guess positive outlook and i could just see him saying this now he'd you know he'd look at you across the table and give you a wink and then he'd say oh never mind love this time next year we'll be laughing yeah. and it was as if the minute he said that you know, light shone through the window. The table would be full of plenty, etc. But more than that, and this is something I, I said in the book, that what he did was he threw our line out into the future. He cast that line ahead. And it was as if the, a grappling hook went boom, right onto the rock of tomorrow. And you could pull yourself in on that. You mm -hmm. could pull yourself in, in the promise that today is not going to be every day. Mm -hmm. this too shall pass mm -hmm. we can get to that other place where we will all be laughing mm -hmm. and i i used to imagine this when he said that i used to imagine us sitting around the dinner table just oh we're just holding our sides killing ourselves laughing you know didn't know you know not knowing what way to turn because our ribs are hurting so much that's when i was a kid i really imagined that i used to well it's all going to get better now yeah, it's all going to get better. I, mean, I felt like this should be the anthem for 2020. The next year, this time, we'll be laughing. But, yeah. you know, there are going to be moments out of this that are so special. It's people who, their children came home that they hadn't seen in a really long time, and everybody lived together. Um, I have a friend who's got four boys. Her son was living in Ethiopia. He came home, and he, his wife was pregnant, and the baby was born. Well, this is something that she might not have been able to experience and share. So there are these moments of light that have come out of the whole thing, as well as the darkness. And you're going to take these moments. Things could be worse. Things could be better. Let's just go that it's going to be better later on. And I can see people picking it up, just hoping that you're clairvoyant. You know, just, oh, let her be clairvoyant. <laughs> I just imagine my dad up there chuckling away, thinking, oh, well, as my mum once said, it was when she was uh, reading my standalone novel, The Care and Management of Lies. She put it down and looked at me about sort of a couple of chapters in and said, you know what? You cannot say a thing around you because you remember it. <laughs> she said, it always ends up in a book. And it was some event that uh, I gave in the life of the uh, main character in that book. Her name was Kezia. And it was something that, my mother had done as a young married woman and she just said you just she said you can't say anything around you it ends up in a book and i'm sure that's what they're saying up there is oh you know look at her she just couldn't leave it alone <laughs> she couldn't leave it alone she couldn't she couldn't leave it's it too, it's too good you had you know it's too good it was too good now how old are you in the photo on the cover here how old are you three three and right. i tell you what should i tell you why i was looking so miserable tell me why because i want to know <laughs> i had just been stung on the lip by a bee oh, I and we, I, and as you can see i'm actually working i'm hop yes. picking yes yes those are hops i'm picking into what they what children would do the um the the adults pick into large bins that are made of sackcloth and wood very large um 
and children, uh, what you do with kids is you'd give them a laundry basket or I had a wicker basket and you, they pick into that and it takes ages for kids to pick hops, but then they tip it into the main bin. So you're working. And uh, so I was three years old and I, a bead crawled out. I can, I can see it as I speak now. I was holding the hops, this big bumblebee crawled out and then landed right here and stung me. And I think someone got the stinger out pretty quickly. Um, and, because, and, and so that obviously someone thought it was really funny to take a photograph of me because I was probably shed a tear or two, but then I'd have to be quiet because, you know, it's only a bee sting. It's, you know, it's not a matter of life and death unless I was allergic to bees. But the funny thing is my, my husband saw a blown up photograph of that blown up version of the photograph. And he said, do you realize you've got a lot of bruises on your arms? I said, well, yeah, it was hard work. You, you're a kid, you get bruised because you're lifting things. And, but I wasn't the only kid working. For goodness but you sake. didn't even think about that. Yeah. No. Well, I also love the part where you didn't also always want shellfish and they always wanted you to eat shellfish. And then later on you realized you were allergic. And it was like, definitely was allergic. So no wonder I didn't eat it all those years. You know, there was a reason. I, I know it was, uh, it's, I, I really was definitely allergic to it. And, uh, I, and we all soon found out <laughs> when my, my, I think I was 11 when my mom said, Oh, please try it. Please try it. And I, you know, just a little bit, you know, I was like, oh, I'm so ill. Never yeah. again, never again, my, ever. My son's allergic to tree nuts and he had a cookie, a little tiny piece when he was three years old. And he turns around and he looks at me and he goes, my mouth's on fire. My lips are blowing up. And I looked and I was like, what? And we had no idea that's what it was. I thought it was, you know, something completely different. And it's yeah. scary though, because you don't even know where that is in other foods and where it touches. So it goes on like that. Well, you also narrate the audiobook of this. And was that always the plan that you would do it? Because it seems like such a natural for you to do it. I had to audition. I had to send... I had to send a tape um, because actually most um, audiobook publishers, they don't necessarily like the author to read mm -hmm. because authors are not professional readers and it can take a lot longer. So I, I actually told them something I did years ago to make extra money when I first came to the States. I did, I did voiceovers. And so I knew what being in a studio was about. I knew how to get the job done. Um, and you know, we, we had, I had to go, I went down to LA to, um, a studio there. It was just me and the technician. He was the other side of the booth and we got that knocked out. Well, I shouldn't say got that knocked out. <laughs> we, 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 uh, we got it finished quite swiftly right? in less than a week. Yeah. That's, and you know, it's funny because even I'll do, like, I'll read the intros of these things and the inflection, like where you have to stop, where you have to breathe so that you continue to do the sentence. It yeah. is an art form to be able to do it. It is. And you have to get into the rhythm of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and to be quite honest, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad someone else does my novels. I mean, mm -hmm. people will say, oh, you should do your novels. I'm thinking, no, it's actually, it's it, not that I'm adverse to hard work, but that's the kind of hard work I want to stop in me as soon as I can. Because yeah. you're in a confined space and, you know, you're, and also, um, you know, because of the fires in California, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it was easy to get very congested. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it was a case of take the Claritin, take the Advil, because that takes out all the, um, uh, any inflammation. And, you know, you're just popping pills just to, mm -hmm. to so your, your throat is open and so on. Um, Interesting. Yes. So, so that. yeah. And it's, um, it, it, and apparently it was happening to a lot of, uh, actors and actresses who, who normally do um, voiceovers that they were having the same kinds of problems. So it wasn't just me. Mm -hmm. It was uh, everyone was getting a bit like snuffly. <laughs> you know, when you were reading, and I think this is so hard for an author to do is, was there a moment where you wanted to change a word? Oh, if I could say that here, because you're reading right off the page, you can't do anything different. And I think that as an author who's edited her own work and been edited, did you have any moments like that of like, oh, let me turn that phrase a different way? I had about half a dozen and here's what I did. I changed it and then we made a note of it and it went immediately to my publisher and they changed it on the, um, they, uh, we were in time to change it. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Because so many times they're like, no, stay with the page. So that, that was, yeah. I was glad the reverse could work. 
yeah, it was yeah. Really good. I mean, I couldn't make all the changes I wanted, but you know, I made. Uh, oh no, no, no! I've got word repetition there. We're going to have to change that. <laughs> you know, uh, I yeah, just you, made an. I just do you made read an, aloud. Do you read aloud? Do you read your book aloud at any point? Because after now, after now doing the audio experience and hearing the repetition or whatever, I've heard of a number of authors that are now reading their books aloud. And they're reading because they said, all of a sudden you realize audio is so important. Like the, the audio experience is big. And I mean, audio used to be like maybe this part business of the, audio, uh, of the business. And now it's been so much bigger. And a lot of people said that they're now reading their books aloud because they can hear something that you're not going to see on the page. Mm. So. I tend to read sections aloud when I'm revising mm -hmm. rather than the whole book because I don't have time to do that usually. Mm -mm. Um, you know, and, and then I find I start reading and then suddenly I'm reading in my head again, da, 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 you know, but I, um, I like, I, when I'm revising, I do, or if there's a certain piece that I just, I'm, I'm worrying it a bit, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read it aloud just, just to see how it sounds. And it's not just for the words, it's for rhythm. People mm -hmm. forget that actually fiction has a rhythm. Mm -hmm. There's a cadence and, to it. Yeah, uh, exactly. There's a cadence to mm -hmm. it. And so I, I think it's incredibly useful to read your work. And one of the things that I find useful, uh, you know, when I'm doing a recording, uh, as I have done, I did one recording for one of my books, and it was the mm -hmm. abridged version of Pondable Lies, is using your hands. That mm -hmm. really helps mm -hmm. if you use your hands, you know. Um, but that comes that. naturally to me. I used to have a teacher who said, are you sure you're not Italian? You know. <laughs> That's my reason. That's what I'm doing. I've got everything else. I've got everything else. I'm a bit of Italian more. <laughs> I told me that too. So what are you working on now? A new Maisie Dobbs book? What are you um, I've, on? I've, uh, and the new Maisie Dobbs book is in production and that's wow. coming out in March. It's called The Consequences of Fear. So there's there'll another. be two books in a year. Two books yeah. in a year. Not a bad, it's, not exactly. a bad COVID life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, I'm always working on something. I've, I've been doing some uh, just recently original uh, pieces that uh, you know to support the um, the memoir and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but I've got some other projects on the go. Well, we look forward to seeing them. <laughs> Absolutely look forward to seeing them. This was such a delight, such a treat. People, I really highly recommend reading this book. And it's and it's you know for fans of your work, yes. But even if you've never read anything else that Jacqueline Winsphere has done, you're going to want to experience this because it's a real snapshot and long movie of what was going on in a time and place. And I think that in a gifted storyteller's hands, it really, really does make a difference. So well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I thank you for joining us today. Thank it's you. Been it's great been such fun. a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great fun. Thank you. And to our readers, we look forward to seeing you next time for another Book Reporter Talks to.